good Sunday morning to you. It's uh, cloudy outside today, and it started to drizzle just a little bit. It's cooling off for us, and it's a, a welcome change in the weather uh, for those of us who have been baking in the sun the past week and a half or so. Uh, we know that summer is far from over, but it's nice to have a little break here and have some cool weather. Uh, I hope that it's pleasant where you are today. We're going to be looking at a section of the, the Sermon on the Mount this morning called the Beatitudes. It's actually the opening section of this famous sermon of our Lord. I would encourage you to have your Bible out and open up to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be studying verses 3 through 12 this morning. We'll get started with that in just a moment give folks some time to find us and to log on and to be ready to join us in our study. As always, uh, Lord willing, we plan to be back on Wednesday evening at seven o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we'll continue our study of the I am statements of Jesus from the gospel of John at that time. We'll be in John chapter 10 and uh, we're going to get two for one uh, this week. Uh, Jesus is going to make the statement, the, the claim, I am the good shepherd and I am the door of the sheep. And we're going to look at both of them, uh, Lord willing, this Wednesday evening. Uh, hope and pray that everyone is staying safe. Uh, the numbers uh, seem to be on the rise in many places. Um, and we know and have heard of people who have tested positive for the virus and you likely uh, do as well, know of people as well. Uh, so let's continue to be safe, just practice common sense and, uh, and keep ourselves safe so that we can uh, live, so that we can do the things that we need to do day by day, so that we can be here tomorrow uh, for our loved ones uh, who need us around. Before we get started, let's go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer, and then we're going to dig into this uh, well-known and very important passage of scripture. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for the day you've given us, that you've brought us safely through this past week and have given us a new day with the promise of a new week that lies ahead. We pray that we would be mindful of you and your will for our lives today and in the days that lie ahead. We ask your blessing upon those who are sick and pray that their health and strength would be returned unto them. To those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, we pray your hand of comfort upon them. For those who continue to be worried and troubled over the things that are happening in the world, we pray that your peace that passes all understanding uh, could be imparted to them and that they could know the joy that comes in trusting in you and serving you. Forgive us of our sins and bless us as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus is said in the beginning of the gospel accounts that he came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus in his preaching was challenging the people of his day to recognize and to anticipate that the kingdom he came to establish would be different. It would not be the same as the kingdoms of the world, and it would not be what they were looking forward to or what they were expecting of the coming Messiah. In the Sermon on the Mount, from start to finish, Jesus is challenging the listeners there on that mountainside to consider how they need to live differently in serving God and in being in his kingdom. And that sermon begins with a section we call the Beatitudes. Now the word Beatitude comes from the Latin word for blessed, which is the word that starts all eight of these Beatitudes. The word blessed means happy, but that, that's a very shallow definition of this Greek word for blessed. The idea is much richer, much deeper, more complex than that. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm made to understand that the Greek word for blessed in this passage cannot adequately be translated with a single English word. The idea really is 
the, the blessedness that we have in knowing that we are living the way that God wants us to live. It's not that we're happy because everything is, is going great for us and the publisher's clearing house people showed up on our front door with a huge check telling us that we've won all kinds of money. That's not the happiness, uh, the blessedness that's talked about here. The blessedness, the happiness here is knowing that God is pleased with our lives. And if we want to live with that kind of blessedness, and knowing that God is pleased with us, give attention, Jesus would say, give attention to these different attitudes, to these different characteristics. As we look through these, uh, we're going to note that uh, these are paradoxical. That is, they are the exact opposite of what we could expect from the world in many cases. Uh, we're going to see that they don't come naturally. They are things that we have to work on. They are not optional. Jesus isn't giving us a, a choice uh, like some of these things that pop up on, on Facebook. If you could only have two of these, which one would you take? No, all eight of these are things that you and I need to be giving attention to, and we need to be taking on uh, and making a part of our character. And, and some have suggested in the Beatitudes that there is a progression that one leads to another as you go through this, this series of characteristics. I don't know that that's entirely the case with every one of them, but, but there is something to be said of us growing spiritually and, and going outside our comfort zone and, and growing as we mature spiritually. And perhaps we can see where one of these would, would naturally follow uh, a, a mastery or not a mastery, but 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 tackling and, and trying to take on one characteristic would naturally lead to the next one and to the next one. So so we'll we'll uh, we'll remember these points as we go through and look at these beatitudes. Uh, the first one in verse three: Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we said these were paradoxical. Uh, how can you be considered blessed? Uh, what's so great? Why would you be happy if you were poor? Uh, there is no real virtue in poverty. The book of Proverbs tells us repeatedly that poverty is to be avoided, that it is the fate that we will suffer if we live foolishly. Notice Jesus specifies blessed are the poor in spirit, not with a bank, not poor in our bank account, or poor in our health, or poor in our circle of friends, but poor spiritually. Blessed is the individual who realizes how they truly stand before God. We're real good, especially in our culture, of building ourselves up and making ourselves think that we're really something. Blessed is the person who can see themselves as God sees them. And how does God see us? Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Spiritually speaking, on our own, we are all bankrupt before God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Blessed is the person who realizes how they stand before God, because theirs is the kingdom of God. What that means is that if we realize, realize that we are sinners and that we stand spiritually bankrupt before God without Christ, we will humble ourselves. We will humble ourselves as we approach God, and that will lead to us doing the things that must be done in order to enter into his kingdom and make heaven our home. So blessed is the person who realizes how they truly stand before God. Secondly, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. People mourn, people cry for different reasons, and not all mourners are comforted. We know this. There are some who continue to mourn and continue to carry sorrows about certain things 
throughout their lives and they don't go away. Here, as we're in these Beatitudes, this is connected directly to the previous admonition. Blessed are those who mourn over their spiritual condition. Blessed are those who realize that they're spiritually bankrupt before God and they don't have a I don't care attitude like so many people around about us. I don't care what God thinks of me. Blessed are the people who do care what God thinks. Blessed are the people who do mourn over their sin and, and mourn over what they have done unto God. The promise is that they will be comforted. We will do the things, if we feel genuine remorse over our sin, that will lead us, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10 says, that will lead us to repentance. And repentance will lead to life. It will lead to forgiveness, which brings us comfort. I know that I've sinned. I know that I have let God down so many times I can't keep track. But what brings me comfort is that God doesn't keep track. I've humbled myself before God. I've sought forgiveness on his terms. And I know that those sins are washed away. Blessed are those who mourn their spiritual condition. They will be comforted. Third, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This beatitude poses a challenge to us because, as we said, it's just the exact opposite of what we see in the world. In the world, those who are meek, those who are unassuming and unassertive, those who are willing to go with the flow without retaliation, without fighting back, those are usually the people who are plowed over, aren't they? Those are usually the people who are ignored at best, tossed aside at worst by those who are climbing up the ladder, who are trying to win at the game of life. Well, meekness is not weakness. You've probably heard that before. That is true. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is a humble, gentle attitude that comes from someone who is pulling themselves in and practicing self-control. It takes great strength to pull in the reins and to practice self-control when you're being provoked, when you're angered, when you're upset, when, when you want something and, and you're, not, you're not running over people to try to accomplish it or, or try to have it. The word for meekness, and I like to bring this up uh, when I study this, this quality, this characteristic. The Greek word for meekness comes from a word that was used for the practice or the observance of the breaking of horses. Horses have incredible strength. As a matter of fact, we still measure a lot of our machines and engines by horsepower, don't we? Horses have incredible power, but if a horse has been broken and a horse has been trained, they can keep that power in check. They've got incredible power, but you can put a small child up on the back of the horse and you can lead the horse and he will walk gently and slowly. All that power, but it's kept under control. That's the idea behind meekness that we are keeping ourselves under control, that we realize that God's way is best and we will yield to him. James chapter one tells us to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. That means I have the attitude that God, whatever your word says, that's what I'll do. I'll set my will aside. I'm not gonna argue. I'm not gonna kick like that horse. I'm not going to kick against it, but I'm going to do what it tells me to do. That's all involved in this idea of weakness. Now, what do we do with the blessing? Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Some of our religious friends and neighbors who teach that 
the saved are going to live on this physical earth for all of eternity will point to this passage and say this is talking about us living here on earth that we will have the earth when all those who are lost are taken off of it and are taken away to hell that's not what the bible teaches the bible teaches that this earth is going to be destroyed it will be no more eternity will be spent in one of two places heaven or hell what does this phrase inherit the earth mean it's actually what what is called an idiom or a figure of speech. It's used sometimes in the Old Testament, and here it is used by Jesus in the New Testament. It's a figure of speech that was used by the Jews of Jesus' day uh, that would have been equivalent to, to the victor go the spoils or winner takes all. You inherit the earth, you get the grand prize, you win it all. Now look at the paradox here. The meek in this world don't win anything. But in the kingdom, those who are meek, those who are willing to allow God to have his way with them, they win it all. They get it all. So that's the blessing there. And one thing about these blessings in the Beatitudes is they're always looking to the future. That, that there is an element of it to be enjoyed now, but they're always looking ultimately to the future. The fourth beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're not to sit in sorrow and mourn over our spiritual condition forever. No, we need to grow from there. If we're spiritually bankrupt, we need to start filling up that account. We need to start filling it. Hunger and thirst. Jesus couldn't have chosen better words. Because hunger and thirst are physical desires that have to be met. We have to eat. And when we're thirsty and we're dehydrated, we have to drink. Blessed are those who have to have righteousness. We are also spiritual beings, not, not just physical, spiritual beings. We dare not starve ourselves. Blessed are those who have a healthy appetite for righteousness, for what is right. And what is righteousness? Righteousness is that which is right in God's eyes. Righteousness is fellowship with God, being right with God, being transformed into God's image. Blessed are those who have a hunger and a thirst for what is right and for a desire to be right with God. This beatitude is actually calling upon us to make a change in our priorities. It's no longer about us, and it's no longer about what we can get in this world. Instead, if we're a part of the kingdom, it's about what God wants, and it's about pursuing the, the kingdom of God. Jesus would go on to say in the Sermon on the Mount, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, that is the food we eat, the water we drink, the clothes we wear, where we lay our head to sleep, all these things will be added to you. Our priority, that desire that has to be met, has to be righteousness. And the promise is, they shall be filled. Not everyone finds what they're looking for in this life, do they? Not everyone finds uh, what they're looking for. Not everyone achieves what they're going after. The promise of Scripture is that if we desire fellowship with God and we hunger and thirst for it and make it the priority in our lives, we'll have it. We will have it. We'll have fellowship with God here now, but we'll especially have fellowship with God in that life which is to come. The next beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy is the, it is kindness and pity. It is the, it's a combination of those two. It's the ability to be touched by the plight of another combined with a desire to help them. You see someone who is suffering misfortune, your heart goes out to them. Uh, but more than that, 
you do what you can to alleviate that suffering. You do what you can to help them to lighten that load that they are carrying. That's the idea of mercy. Those two things join together. Mercy arises from within us, not because we find anything especially attractive about those around about us who are in trouble, but it really arises from within us because we realize that we have received mercy. We have received mercy from others and we have received mercy from God. Think about it. God looked down and saw mankind lost in sin and he felt pity, but he did more than just feel pity. He did what he could to help. He sent his son to die on the cross so our sins could be forgiven. God has shown us mercy. And when we understand that, we won't plow over those who are bowed down with suffering. No, we will stop and we will help to pick them up. The promise is that the merciful will receive mercy. This promise stands out to me because, again, I'm aware of the sins that I've committed. I know what I have done to God. And I know that on that last day, I'm going to need mercy. I'm going to need mercy when I stand before my God. So the way that I ensure that I will receive mercy then is by making sure that I show mercy now. James writes in James chapter 2, <clears throat> James chapter 2 and at verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I want mercy on that day, and I do. I'll need it. I have to show mercy now. Scriptures teach that we reap what we sow. If we sow callousness and an uncaring attitude towards those around about us, that's what we'll get. We need to show mercy towards those who are suffering. The next beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Our heart is the important part of us. Our heart is not the blood pump. The Bible heart is really the mind of God, the seat of his emotions. And it's extremely important that we protect our heart and we keep it safe. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Flow the issues of life. In this proverb, Life, our lives, are pictured as a stream. And the heart is the fountainhead. The heart is where that stream begins. You keep it. You guard it. That's the idea behind keep your heart. You guard it. You don't want somebody coming in and polluting it. Because if you pollute the stream at the fountainhead, the entire stream is polluted. And if you and I pollute our hearts, we allow impurities to come into our heart, the entire life will be polluted. You see the lesson taught there. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who keep their hearts pure. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 23, Here's another illustration uh, that I like to use that comes from the teaching of Christ. Uh, here in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is pronouncing woe upon the Pharisees because they were hypocrites. They were putting on a show outwardly that they were really something else, being meticulous in detail to show outwardly that they were righteous. But inwardly, you know, God sees the heart. Jesus saw through the show, and he saw that their hearts were full of wickedness. He tells them in Matthew chapter 25 
uh, 23 rather, Matthew 23, verses 25 and 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. I like to use this illustration when you're doing dishes. You run that sink full of hot soapy water. And when you got that dirty cup or that dirty bowl, you put it down in that water. You get the rag and you clean out the inside of that cup. You get the inside clean. That's where the food goes, right? You get the inside clean. Now, what's naturally going to happen to the outside of the bowl, to the outside of that cup, down in that soapy water while you're cleaning out the inside? It's going to get clean too. Here's the point that Jesus is making so very well. If we will clean our heart, if we will clean our lives up from the inside, the outside will take care of itself. If we'll get our hearts right, if we'll get them cleansed, if we'll get it squared away and pointed in the right direction, everything that comes out will be okay. We need to get our heart right. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That blessing is the one that should be the most attractive to all of us. I want to see God one day. I want to see my creator. And I don't want to see him as an angry judge who is condemning me away from his presence for all of eternity. I want to see the face of God as my father welcoming me home. But if I have sin in my life, I won't be welcome before God. In the book of 1 Peter, at chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. If we're going to be with God, we need to be like God. And God is holy. God is pure. So you and I need to strive to be pure in heart. Be pure with our thoughts. Be pure with our intentions. Be pure with our words. Be pure with our actions. But remember, it all flows from the heart. So let's clean the heart and everything else. It'll take care of itself. The next beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Christians are to be peaceable people. As much as depends on you, live at peace with all men, Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 12. And at verse 18, we're to be known of as peaceable people. That doesn't mean that we're not soldiers. That doesn't mean that we don't have armor and that we're not to fight the good fight of faith. But we're not to fight with each other. We're not to fight amongst ourselves. There are some people that just love to fight. Some people that you're around them any amount of time at all, they're going to try to argue with you. They're going to try to start a fight with you. They're, 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 they like to do that not God's people. And if that's the way I am, I've got to change. I've got to change. I've got to repent of that. And I've got to learn to be a peacemaker. Here's the thing. Any fool can start a fight. Anyone can start a fight. But the person who keeps fights from happening, the person who can walk away when when people are getting angry, uh, when tensions are starting to build, the person who can walk away from that, that's a special person. The person who can step in and help two people reconcile their differences and come together again before it escalates to the point of a fight, that's a special person. That's a peacemaker. And Jesus says they'll be recognized 
as sons of God. They'll be recognized as people of God because God is a God of peace. His son is the Prince of Peace. You and I need to be peacemakers. There's a lot of fighting that goes on in our world. We've seen a lot of it in our society around us here recently. Those aren't the people of God. They're not living like children of God. We are to be peacemakers. You know, another part of that, another aspect of that is we are to help people to be at peace with God. That is, we're to take people who are in their sin. And if they are mourning over that sinful condition and that, that their poverty before God, we need to help them to seek God's forgiveness through his gospel. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called sons of God. Anybody can start a fight. You and I need to be peacemakers. And then finally, the, the end of these Beatitudes takes a very surprising turn. Jesus talks about those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Well, if we have chosen to abandon the way of this world and to identify ourselves with Christ and to, to bring about the changes in our lives that the gospel calls upon us to make, the world isn't going to appreciate it. This is becoming more and more a, and I heard this quote uh, just yesterday, a post-Christian world. A post-Christian world. That is, this, this society that we live in has moved beyond being Christian. And they've moved on to something else. And now the Christian way of life, which used to be the normal way of life, whether you were a Christian or not, you recognize that's the way people thought. That's the way things were conducted in our society. We've moved beyond that. Christians are well in the minority now. And we're going to feel that. We're going to feel that. We may not be drug off and fed to the lions, uh, but we're going to have some doors shut in our face. We're going to have some opportunities closed to us that uh, that are presented to others who aren't Christians, who are willing to, to make concessions and to compromise their faith. We're going to suffer. Jesus says that we will be persecuted for specific reasons. Uh, we'll be persecuted for righteousness sake. That is for, for living and, and pursuing and hungering and thirsting and desiring after those things that are right before God. He says that, that we will suffer, that we will be hated, that we people will speak evil against us and lie about us. Jesus says, for my sake, because we have identified ourselves with Christ and we are seeking his kingdom and we are living for him. People are going to hate us for that. They're not going to appreciate that we're putting Jesus first. And we're told that this is what has always happened to God's people. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You read through the Bible and you'll see that God's people have always been persecuted by the world to one degree or another. And when we are persecuted for our faith, we know we're on the right track. We know that we're doing what is right. And that's a blessing. Because although we might be in circumstances that are hard around about us, we know that God is pleased with us. And at the end of the day, again, that's what really matters. I want to close by reading a quote by a, a fellow named John R.W. Stott. He's written a book on the Sermon on the Mount called Christian Counterculture. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a good book in, in helping us to understand, to dig in deeper to the Sermon on the Mount. But he makes this statement about the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes paint a comprehensive portrait of a Christian disciple. We see him first alone on his knees before God, acknowledging his spiritual poverty and mourning over it. This makes him meek or gentle in all his relationships, since honesty compels him to allow others to think of him what God, uh, what before God he confesses himself to be. 
yet he is far from acquiescing in his sinfulness, for he hungers and thirsts after righteousness, longing to grow in grace and in goodness. We see him next with others out in the human community. His relationship with God does not cause him to withdraw from society, nor is he insulated from the world's pain. On the contrary, he's in the thick of it, showing mercy to those battered by adversity and sin. He is transparently sincere in all his dealings and seeks to play a constructed role as a peacemaker. Yet he is not thanked for his efforts, but rather opposed, slandered, insulted, and persecuted on account of the righteousness for which he stands in the Christ with whom he is identified. Such is the man or woman who is blessed, that is, who has the approval of God and finds self-fulfillment as a human being. I like those words. I think it summarizes very well the passage of scripture that we've been studying this morning. My hope and my prayer that this has helped you, that you will take this, this well-known passage of scripture and you'll dig into these eight points a little bit deeper and you'll consider how you need to be making the changes in your life with all of these knowing that blessings correspond to them, not, not just blessings in the future, which are going to be great things for us to enjoy one day, but above all of that, knowing that we're pleasing God now. Maybe you don't have it perfectly. Maybe you're not the most merciful or the most meek person. Take steps. Growth is a process. It's not instantaneous. It's a process. Take those steps. Go back and revisit this passage from time to time. Chart your progress. Make sure that you're growing and you're being what the Lord would have you to be. So glad that you joined us this morning, that you, you've had your Bible out and, and hope that this study has helped you. Uh, here at the Knollwood Church of Christ, we're going to meet this morning in, in just about 25 minutes for a morning worship service, and, and we're going to talk about the Beatitudes in that hour. Uh, we're going to approach it a little bit differently. It's going to be the same same scripture, same points. Uh, then at three o'clock, we're going to meet, and we're going to study from John chapter nine. Uh, we're going to look at Jesus healing the man who was born blind, which was a part of that, that section in John that we studied Wednesday night, when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I'm looking forward to worshiping uh, with my brethren uh, later today, and I hope that that's the case with you. Uh, but may God bless you wherever you are. Uh, continue to, to dig into his word. And as we always say, be a light to those around about you today. Uh, let the light of Christ shine. Let people see that God is making a difference in your life, and that will lead others under Christ. That's how you can let God use you to bring others unto him. Stay faithful to the Lord. Let's stay safe. And thank you so very much for being with us this morning.